Mother Jones magazine. There's a very interesting article. It's the end of the world as we know it. The distinct burden of being a climate scientist. It had a number of stories, but one of the climate scientists talking about it was a woman named Kim Cobb. In a row house made of cinder blocks on the tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, she monitored the American election results using a satellite uplink that took several minutes to load a page. When she saw Donald Trump's victory, she felt shock and soon descended into severe depression. I have the firm belief that Washington would act on climate change and it would be acting soon, the 44-year-old cop said. When Trump was elected, it came crashing down. Back home in Atlanta, Cobb entered what she now called an acute mental health crisis. Most mornings, she could not get out of bed, despite having four children to tend to. She would sob spontaneously. She obsessed about the notion that the U.S. government would take no action to address climate change and confront its consequences. I could not see forward, she recalled. My most astounding thought was, how could my country do this? I had to face the fact that there was a veritable tidal wave of people who don't care about climate change and who put personal interests above the body of scientific information that I had contributed to. Her depression persisted for weeks. I didn't recognize myself, she said. What's interesting to me is not so much the climate change angle, but the story angle. She lives within a story, and that story has elements. What our culture tends to do is take all of our little stories and try to zip them up into one big story. It's amazing how whether you watch the local or the national news, one guy gets almost all the news, and now for the next year and a half, all the news will be about whether that guy will still be in the White House. And this becomes the obsession of the world and impacts people all in their own different ways. So everybody's watching the clock. In February, the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary. Here in California, March, March 3, in fact, has Super Tuesday, where Californians will all go to the polls. This isn't really just about politics. We all live in a little consciousness bubble. Maybe it's climate change. Maybe it's abortion. Maybe it's something falling apart in your house. Maybe it's the neighbor that plays their music too loud. Maybe it's the nagging illness of your spouse. Maybe it's the relationship that you just can't get right. Maybe it's the responsibility of a parent or a child. Maybe it's the bills coming due. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your favorite TV show going off Netflix. We live in these little bubbles, and these bubbles possess us. And when things are aligning as we want them to, we're happy. And when things are crashing down around us, we're distraught, and our whole life comes apart. It's a little timeless cloud we call consciousness, and it dominates. It, in fact, it creates reality around us. 
And the frame can be as large as your feelings about climate change or politics, or as small as the strife in a personal relationship or chronic pain. And our image of the future dominates us. Will the bills cover to the end of the month? Will the cancer grow? Will Trump get reelected? Will my political party lose? And it fills our world. And in fact, people live and die. And in fact, sometimes take their lives depending upon this image. It's literally the worlds we live in. Now this has everything to do with who we're listening to. And last week and this week, we're looking at the prophet Zechariah. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this post-exilic pillar period where a group of Jews were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, spent 50 years there, and now they're dribbling back because of a political change, and they're wondering, will God restore our fortunes? But each of them would apply this in a very different way. Will my animals reproduce? Will I be able to find a spouse that I love? Will my parent get well or die? Will my child get well or die? All of these things, you might think, well, we live in a very different world than the people of 500 BC in Jerusalem. We do and we don't. It's sort of in the middle. Now, prophets had come along, like, like Jeremiah, and he said the exile will last 70 years. And then the New Jerusalem, and this New Jerusalem becomes sort of a pivotal point by which we think everything will be wonderful. Somewhere over the rainbow, or if you remember folk music, the Big Rock Candy Mountain, where if you, find, if you Google that song somewhere, it's a great song from the Depression era, where... You know, streets are made with gold, and, and you know, it was, a, it was kind of a hobo song where, you know, whiskey and beer are flowing from the tap, and this is what everyone is looking for. Now, we're a very scientific people, and so we have all our polling data, and so people now, over the next couple of years, will take endless polls. Biden or Trump or Harris or Trump or Sanders or Trump or Warren or Trump. It's amazing how little we remember. October 21, 2016, Hillary had an 86.6% chance. <laughs> Donald had a 13.3. How quickly we forget. Well, why do we forget? Because we live in this little consciousness cloud and memory it's just kind of outside of it and foggy. I remember, I don't know if she's watching today, but I remember after 9-11, Nancy was very concerned. Nancy Shuler was very concerned that Osama bin Laden was going to target her home. I said, I don't think so. I think College Green is probably safe. <laughs> but this is what we live in. We live with our fears. We live with our anxieties. And, and then we look around with the tools that we have, and we try to predict the future, and you know what? We're really bad at it. Most of the time, people come and they tell me, Pastor, this is what I'm afraid of. And I listen, and much of the time, it doesn't come about. But those fears grip us. For the exiles, their issues were life and death. And that is sort of how they are for us too, often. None of us get out of this world alive. And it's not just big picture things, as we noted. It's the little things. And then there's the validations. So if you read the book of Zechariah, these last few chapters, you have some of these amazing passages. See, you have them in the book of Matthew. They get picked up. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, 
See, your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of them, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Palm Sunday. Zechariah. The people were excited. The prophecies are coming true. Everything is coming about just as they had hoped. And, well, did it? What's happening? What's that? Can't be here, Daniel. There you have it. There you have it. Old little world. Jesus comes in riding on a donkey. Everyone imagines, this is it. The kingdom has come. What will happen? You going to make sure that he leaves for us? Yeah. Thanks. He, he went, yeah, he, he did go down there. <laughs> yep. But if you go back into the book of Zechariah, what do you find? Chapter 9 starts with all of this regional geopolitical issues, most of which someone nicely sits down to read for their devotions. They read a prophecy. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach. And you all say, what's a Hadrach? Where's Hadrach? For the eyes of all people and all the tribes of, of Israel are on the Lord, and on Hamath too, which borders on it, and on Tyre and Sidon, though they are very skillful. And you say, well, what is this? I thought, I thought the Bible was supposed to tell us the future. And then you have the coming of Jesus. Rejoice, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. And now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow. I will fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrows will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south, and the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bowl used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. It's like a dream. The words grab us. We wonder. These words were spoken 500 B.C., and they heard them, and they fixated on them, and they put their hope in them. Did they come true? 
Can they come true? When? How? Now we might imagine, well, we know how the world should be. Well, tell me when you were safe and the world was under your control. Just had a little episode of that. When Daniel was around, do you feel safe? Does the world feel under control? Was it in the 30s and 40s when there was Stalin and Hitler and Mao? Was it in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when we were in, worried about the Cold War and nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union? What is it, was it in the 90s and aughts? Was life dandy then? In 1948, C.S. Lewis wrote an article called Living in, the, in an Atomic Age. Because in 1948, the Russians got the bomb. And after World War II, everyone felt comfortable. Well, the United States is clearly the superpower over the world. But when Russia got the bomb, people were scared. Why? It could all end. We could nuke each other. And over the next 30 years, we built more and more and more and more, and they were on hair triggers. And in the Cuban Missile Crisis, the US and the Soviet Union came nose to nose, and Russia blinked. And there were other episodes that are far less famous when the Soviets, their computers were wrong, and it was mistaken for a US preemptive strike. The Soviets could have launched, they didn't. Anxious. C.S. Lewis writes this. What the wars and the weather, Louisiana, what the wars and the weather and the atomic bomb have really done is remind us forcibly of the sort of world we are living in, and which during the prosperous period before 1914. C.S. Lewis's life, he fought in the First World War, we were beginning to forget. And this reminder is, so far as it goes, a good thing. We have been waked from a pretty dream, and now we can begin to talk about realities. We see at once, when we have been waked, that the important question is not whether an atomic bomb is going to obliterate civilization or whether climate change is going to obliterate civilization, or whether the end of antibiotics is going to obliterate civilization, or if a stray asteroid will come into the atmosphere and obliterate civilization. Because if you start looking at this list, you very quickly begin to realize there's all sorts of things that can do it. And by the way, many of us will die before any of that happens. This is the world we live in. We just don't think about it. For a good reason sometimes. The important question is whether nature, the thing studied by the sciences, is the only thing in existence. Because if you answer yes to the second question, then the first question only amounts to asking whether the inevitable frustration of all human activities may be hurried on by our own action instead of coming at its natural time. That is, of course, a question that concerns us very much. Even on a ship, which certainly will sink sooner or later, the news that the boiler may blow up now would not be heard with indifference by anyone. So if we look at Miss Kim Cobb, what world does she live within? We, and look how she defines we, is it our species, is it our family, is it our country, is it me, can secure our future through science, politics, money, power, propaganda, media, what have you. She had placed her hope in a particular imagined political scenario that would yield an outcome. And her depression was caused by the reality that we couldn't ensure that outcome. Now that this story won't play out her expectations, 
depression, suicide, anger, escape, hedonism. It's all the same. In fact, you see this in people's lives. I was expecting to get this job. I was expecting to get this spouse. I was expecting to get this operation. I was expecting to get this check, and it didn't come. And now, my life is over. Usually the last one, tyranny, is what we default to. We have to take the government, right? We have to take it for our side, our team, or in a family, we have to take control. We have to take control of the spouse, we have to take control of the kid, we have to take control of the parent. We've got to take control of Daniel. Yeah, go ahead and try. Our far smaller worlds yield the same experience. People take such measures after a romantic breakup, a lost job, a cancer diagnosis, or losing a soccer match. But what if nature is our sister, not our mother, alienated by her will, not by her will, but by ours? But what then is nature? And how do we come how do we come to be imprisoned in a system so alien to us? Oddly enough, the question becomes much less sinister the moment we realize that nature is not all. Mistaken for our mother, she is terrifying and even abominable. But if she is only our sister, if we have a common creator, if she is our sparring partner, then the situation is quite tolerable. Perhaps we are not here as prisoners, but as colonists. Only consider what we have done already to the dog, the horse, or the daffodil. She is indeed a rough plaything, and there are elements of evil in her. To explain, that would carry us far back. I would have to speak of powers and principalities, and all that would send a modern reader most what would sound to a modern reader most mythological. This is not the place, nor do these questions come first. It is enough to say here that nature, like us, but in her different way, is as much alienated from her creator, though in, um, though in her, as in us, gleams an old beauty, gleams of old beauty remain. But they are not to be worshipped, but to be enjoyed. She has nothing to teach us. It is our business to live with our own law, by our own law, not by hers. To follow in private or in public life the law of love and temperance, even when they seem to be suicidal, and not the law of competition and grab, even when they seem to be necessary for our own survival. Do you understand what he's saying? Miss Kim Cobb could easily become a tyrant based on climate change. The other side easily becomes tyrants based on, pick your issue, immigration, the economy, abortion, any issue you want, you can become a tyrant. You can become a tyrant in your home over fill in the blank. What if nature is not our mother, but our sister? And what, in fact, if the decisions of your life have everything to do with the Creator and your relationship to Him? The book of Zechariah talks about the coming of the King. The King comes to the city and is rejected. But in this little passage of Zechariah, is that most implicit miracle in Palm Sunday that we brush over. Jesus mounts an unbroken animal and it carries him like a servant. Nature is the servant of the king. The problem is we are bad servants. What power do we have do we have power to blow up the world? Seems we do. 
Do we have the power to cook it? Quite possibly. Maury has some little charts on the back wall about, about the ocean levels by the Golden Gate Bridge. And if you want to talk to someone about climate change, Maury can tell you quite a bit. He's in fact, goes all over the world and lectures on it. Do we have the power to stop ourselves? There is the interesting question. That is almost always the interesting question. Because the answer is often no. What responsibility do we have to love our neighbor as ourselves? To care for the garden he has given us to live in. Forrest, you might want to go out there. Oh, she's leaving. Okay. That's for Nadia. She's all right. She's a lot crazier than Daniel, by the way. She's just a lot smaller. <laughs> Before you can steward the world, you must steward yourself. We just had two examples of individuals who can't steward themselves. Before you can steward the world, you must steward yourself. Let's pray. Lord, we live in a world of nuclear bombs, of homelessness, of mental illness, of divorce, of addiction, of anxiety. We can control many things, but most of the time we can't control ourselves. Help us, Lord, to look to you. Help us to look to the King, who can mount an unbroken animal, enter into his own city, willingly be rejected, and crucify and rise again to reign. May we believe in this story. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?